So open your Bibles this morning, Colossians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter um, chapter 2, and Job chapter 38. In Colossians chapter 1, we have arrived at verse 12, 12 and 13. The apostle said, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now I want you to notice in these two verses that two kingdoms are recognized. In verse 13, you have the power of darkness. That's one kingdom. In verse 12, he speaks of the saints in light, which in verse 13 he identifies as the kingdom of his dear son. So we have a kingdom of darkness, and we have a kingdom of light. I submit to you that those are the only two kingdoms that exist not only in the world, but in our entire universe. And you are either in one of those two kingdoms. Now, if you say that you're in the kingdom of light, and you don't know how you got into the kingdom of his dear son, you're not in it. People who are in the kingdom of his dear son know that they're in the kingdom of his dear son and they know how they got into that kingdom. So if you're not in it, you're in the kingdom of darkness by default. When you were born into this world, your entrance into this world automatically placed you right smack dab into the kingdom of darkness. Why is this important? Well, it's important for this reason. When you die, what kingdom you are in will determine where you spend eternity. So it's very important. It's so important that every fallen child of Adam needs to consider what kingdom they're in. So I want to talk to you today about these two kingdoms. So I want you to notice in verse 13 those words. The power of darkness sounds eerie and foreboding, doesn't it? Sounds menacing, even ominous. Those four words, the power of darkness. They're only found two times in your King James Bible. One of the times, obviously, is right here in verse 13. The other time it's found is, you remember when the Lord Jesus Christ was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Luke 22 account, the disciples were praying, but what happened? They fell asleep. Jesus Christ said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray, lest you fall into temptation. And, and while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the, small, with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. That's a drastic piece of work right there. You think about that for one moment. How would you like to see somebody get their ear cut off with a sword? 
And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye this fire. You know, just, just put up with this right for now. And he touched his ear and healed him. Now you think about that for a moment. <laughs> In front of all those people. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves? When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, colon. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. The words in verse 13 take us back to Gethsemane. Here comes the traitor with the mob and the weapons and the warrant in their hands to arrest him. Roman soldiers follow behind. The arrest of the Son of God is the only goal they have. Now in Matthew's account, at this point, when the Roman soldiers come with Judas, this is what the Lord said. Thinkest thou that I cannot now to pray to my Father, and he shall presently, immediately, emphasis is mine, it's not capitalized and underlined in your King James Bible. Okay, I put that there. Don't you know that right now, if I want... I can pray to my Father, and He will give me more than 12 legions of angels. Now, what's a legion? A legion was a division of, of the Roman army containing more than 6,000 men. Okay? That would be more than 6,000 angels. 6,000 times 12 legion equals 72,000 angels. Now you think of that. 72,000 angels with drawn swords looking over the battlements of heaven, ready to put an end and stop this unbelievable false accusation and false arrest. One word from him. And they would have swarmed down from heaven with swords drawn and burst upon this scene and put an end to this madness. Think of it. Those marching soldiers with their shields and swords and spears and helmets they had no power over him. He did not need 12 legions of angels to help him. One word from him and his foes fell over backwards. Remember that? John 18 verse 6. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am. I am the great I am. They went backward and fell to the ground. Now you imagine how they felt when they hit the ground. And you imagine how they felt when they stood up. I mean, you think about it. Shields, swords, spears, and helmets all falling backward at the same time would have sounded like uh, when they drop stainless steel pots in a, in a restaurant and you hear it in, in, the, in, in, the, in the kitchen. Imagine, imagine the, the commotion that that made that night. There wasn't just two or three soldiers. They come in legions. That's how they work. And then when they got up, can you imagine they're all looking at each other like, man, what, what happened? And then one of them says, he wants us to arrest him. 
Huh? You go. Remember that car they invented years ago called Yugo? That's where they got the title for that car. They read this story. They said, no, you go. I'm not going. <laughs> but listen, he allowed himself to be taken because he had said to them, this is your hour and the power of darkness. You think of that. In Gethsemane, he allowed them to arrest him. As scared as they were, he allowed Judas to plant that infamous kiss on his cheek. He allowed them to drag him, drag him that evening from one place to another, from Annas to Caiaphas, to Pilate, to Herod, back to Pilate. He let them, he allowed them to bully him. He let them mock him and malign him and, and manhandle him and maul him. He let them smite him and scourge him and crucify him because he had said, this is your hour and the power of darkness. And the darkness deepened. They put him on the cross and they killed him and the sun went out. And darkness was over the whole land. And it all ended in a darkened tomb that had been hewn out of rock. And for three days and three nights, the world went on its way. While the lifeless body of Jesus Christ lay in that tomb, it looked like the power of darkness had triumphed. For three days and three nights, men went about their affairs as though nothing had happened. The soldiers changed guard at the tomb. Pilate wrestled with his conscience. Pilate's wife fought with the memory of her dreams. I had a dream about that man. Don't do anything to him. Remember that? Herod sneered. Caiaphas and Annas probably shook hands over their false triumph. It was their hour and the power of darkness. And darkness reigned at that time. We know what happened next. On the third day, he shook the power of darkness. The earth quaked and he rose from the dead. So there's two places in your Bible where these words are found. In Luke chapter 22 and in Colossians chapter 1. I said at the beginning that we would talk about these two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light or the kingdom of his dear son. Who knows what the first book in the Bible was? Is. That's right. It's the book of Job. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Job was a contemporary of Abraham. Abram. Remember that? Now since Job is the first book in the Word of God, there will be many truths in that book that are first. I asked you to mark Job chapter 38, right? Yes. I want you to look with me at Job chapter 38 and verse 19. 38 verse 19. Where is the way where light dwelleth? And as for darkness, where is the place thereof? 
Now I will tell you that the light and the darkness in this verse are not the light that the sky produ that is produced in the sky by the sun and the darkness in this verse is not just the absence of light. If I were to ask anyone what's darkness? The common answer is darkness is the absence of light. You know, when you walk into a dark room, you flip on the switch, the light goes on, and the darkness disappears. But this light and this darkness are not the light and the darkness that we see around us on a daily basis or, on, or during the evening. That's not what these lights are. Notice, where is the way where light dwelleth? Now, if there's a way to that place, there's a way where light dwelleth, there's a way to get to it. Is there someone in the Bible who said, I am the way? Yes, there is, isn't there? Darkness, and as for darkness, where is the place thereof? Darkness has a place. That's why this cannot be the darkness of atmospheric conditions like we experience during the nighttime that surrounds us. That darkness does not have a place where it dwells. But there is a darkness that does have a place. And the reason I say that is because of the next verse, verse 20. That thou shouldest take it. Take what? The way. The way. Take the way. That thou shouldest take it. Take the way to the bound thereof. To the boundaries of it. And that thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof. Now I want you to notice the word house. To the house thereof. Now again, atmospheric darkness does not have a house. Unless it's the house of the prince of darkness. Notice that, that thou shouldest take it to the bound thereof. These two realms, light and darkness, have a bound, or they have boundaries. There is a boundary that separates us from the light of darkness. This verse, verse 20, that thou shouldest know the paths, notice that, paths, Plural. Paths. There's a path to both these houses. That thou shouldest know. The word know is an intimate knowledge of these two houses. So people have an intimate knowledge of the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his dear son. Or they have an intimate knowledge with the house of darkness. You're in one or the other. Now in both of these houses, someone is in authority. Someone is controlling. In both of these houses, there is a throne. Now if you remember in John chapter 1, John said that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Right? So the throne of light is the throne of God. The kingdom of God's dear son. Where is it? Psalm 103 verse 19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens. And his kingdom ruleth. Over all. And also, Psalm 93, verse 2 Thy throne is established of old. 
thou art from everlasting. So God's throne is established from eternity past, and we know that it's established in the heavens because that's where it was prepared. And who represents the throne of darkness? Satan, that's right, the God of this world. Don't get ahead of me, okay? <laughs> he also has a throne. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the earth. Notice, I will exalt my throne. I will exalt it. So he thought. And where is his throne? Well, temporarily, who is the God of this world? See, you got ahead of me. In the book of Job, the very first book in your Bible, in the very first chapter, of that book, the first book that was ever written, guess who you're introduced to? Job 1 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. That is amazing. The very first book in human history. Six verses in, introduce you to the prince of darkness, to the prince of the kingdom of darkness. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then answered, then answered the, then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth. And from walking up and down in it. So, first of all, why is Satan introduced in the very first chapter of the very first book that was ever given to man? Well, I'll tell you. Because the two realms of light and darkness are the only two realms that make up the world and the universe that we live in. The fact that he's going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it is a sign of ownership. You remember, I'm not going to put the verses here, but in Genesis chapter 13, when Lot was separated from Abraham, I'll read you the verses. Genesis 13, 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. Now, who owns that land? The God of this world. He told Jesus Christ in the, in the temptation, you know, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world because they're mine to give. You worship me, I'll give them to you. He owned this land. Now God is telling Abraham, all the, everything you see, I'm going to give it to you. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Now, look what God tells Abraham. Arise. Walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto you. Walking through the land in the breadth of it and the width of it is a demonstration of ownership. And God was showing Satan, this is who's going to get this land. Okay? So Satan is introduced in the very first book of the Bible, or well, the first book written. The book of Job. What do we learn from the book of Job? We learn that Job himself is in a struggle between the kingdom of light 
and the kingdom of darkness. The struggles that Job goes through in his own life in the book of Job are a demonstration of the kingdoms of light and darkness. All people at all times in history have always belonged to one of those two kingdoms. You remember how Matthew's gospel begins? It begins like this, Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Now the people which sat in darkness were not sitting in the darkness of atmospheric conditions like nighttime. This was a spiritual darkness. The light which sprung up was not the sun breaking the horizon in the morning. This was the light of the world coming to redeem Israel from that darkness. This is how Luke says it, Luke chapter 1, verse 76. And thou, child, this is talking about John the Baptist, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, why? To give light to them that sit in the darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. What Je when Jesus Christ came into the world, this was the fulfillment of the prophetic program that had been spoken of throughout the entire old economy. But under what kingdom were Israel when Jesus Christ came into the world? Under what dominion were they? The kingdom of darkness. The dominion, the realm of darkness. Okay? So look at this verse in Acts chapter 26. This is talking about the Apostle Paul delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. This is the Apostle Paul. You have to excuse me, but I'm going to remove this. Thank you. It must be hot in here, but you're not sweating, right? Not yet. Let's see if we can heat it up. <laughs> I'm joking. So this is Paul. This is Paul. He's sent to the Gentiles. Why is he sent to the Gentiles? To, that's the purpose, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto the power of God, well, unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Here's the two kingdoms. To turn them from darkness to light. A few moments ago, we said that darkness is the absence of light. That's only true in the physical world. It is not true in the spiritual world in the world of the powers of darkness. There's something that people in the kingdom of darkness do not have. In this verse, verse 18, what is it that people in the kingdom of darkness do not have? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. They do not have forgiveness. What do people in the kingdom of his dear son have? Oh, man. That is a huge difference. You know, there's people talking about everybody's forgiven of all their sins. I mean, there was a post this morning, for goodness sakes, from Elder Scott Ray. About, oh, yeah, 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 everybody's forgiven. Every 
Let me tell you, the people who come up with that doctrine, they're just plain afraid to share the gospel with unsaved people. So they just, you know, that way, hey, I don't have to talk to anybody. Everybody's forgiven. Everybody's going to go to heaven. Everything's honky-tory. It's the only reason those things exist. This verse says that they may receive forgiveness of sins. If everybody's forgiven, how can somebody receive forgiveness of sins? How can you receive it if you already have it? Right? I mean, listen, this is not rocket science. You don't have to be a genius. All you have to know is how to read simple, basic, fundamental, elementary English. That's all that is. So we have forgiveness. What a huge difference. What this verse says, isn't that what Paul says here? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness? Again, what do they not have in the kingdom of darkness? Yeah, they don't have forgiveness. Are we still in that kingdom? So what do we have? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I'm making a big deal out of it. Because I'll tell you something right now. It is a big deal. It is a big deal. It's a big deal for you to enter into and understand. And notice, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Matter of fact, let's read verse 12 and 13. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath, past tense, delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. That is exactly why Jesus Christ sent Paul. Right? Okay. To turn them from darkness... To light. And in Acts 26, 18, why? That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Now I'm going to put verses 13 and 14 up here. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Wow. Now, I want to stop here for a moment. I want us to think about something. The kingdom of darkness, it's a kingdom of deception. The kingdom of darkness wants you to believe that by doing certain things, certain spiritual things, certain religious things, that you can make yourself acceptable to God. When you hear someone say, I'm okay with the man upstairs, you know you're listening to a person who has been deceived by the prince of darkness. He's deceived by it. You know people join programs today, self-help programs. They join AA, they join NA, they join all sorts of programs to, to free themselves from the addictions and the habits that are destroying their lives. And in many cases, though a lot of those programs do help people. They do help, they, you know, they help them clean up their acts. You know, a lot of people stop stealing to support their habits. They stop beating their wives. They stop beating their children. And that's very commendable. I mean, that's a great thing to happen. But the problem, the deception begins when those people think that because they stopped doing something, that now God is pleased with them. Okay? And nothing could be further from that truth. Because they're still in the kingdom of darkness, where there is no forgiveness. See that? Outwardly, they've changed. And that's a great thing. They may even put on a suit and go to Mass. 
or go to some church. Their problem is they still have not received the forgiveness of sins because that can only come by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and trusting that for the forgiveness of your sins. So I want to just take a few moments and look at the characteristics of this kingdom of darkness. The most profound explanation of it in your Bible is found in Ephesians chapter 2. I asked you to mark Ephesians chapter 2 when we began, right? Ephesians chapter 2, and you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, this is definitely one of the characteristics of the kingdom of darkness, of those who are still in the kingdom of darkness, or they're dead in trespasses and sins. That's what they are. You and I, we're no longer there. Hopefully, hopefully everybody in this room no longer belongs to the kingdom of darkness because we were quickened, we were made alive by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Notice verse 2, wherein ye walk, that's the time past of your life, of your own life, you walked in what? You walked in dead and trespasses and sins, spiritually dead, in trespasses and sins. That's where you walked. And what characterized your life then? Well, notice those words. According to, according to, or harmonizing with. You know, when we say people are in one accord, we're saying that they agree with each other. They're in accord on a certain matter. Okay. In the time past of our lives, before we trusted Jesus Christ to save us, we walked according to, or in harmony with, to, the course of this world. The course of this world. What's the course of this world? I grew up with several courses in my life. I don't even mean school courses. Of course, those are courses. There's courses there that teach you today all the wrong things. But I grew up skiing. I raced ski in ski competitions my entire, from the time I was four years old until I graduated from high school. That's what I did. In those races, we had slalom courses. We had giant slalom, where they put the flags down the hill, and you have to ski between them. Or they've got tight slalom, where the, the poles are really close to each other, and you've got to go Ch -ch -ch -ch. Those are called slalom courses. Today, I have another course in my life. Anybody know what that is? Golf, Golf course, yeah. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. You start on the first tee box, you tee off, you hit a ball on the green, you make a putt for a birdie. That's what happens in my life. I don't know how it happens with you, but that's how it happens for me, okay? <laughs> Not all the time. I'm joking. Then you go to the second tee box, and you do the same thing. Then you go to the third. That's a course. What is a course? A course is a carefully laid out and organized path for you to follow. So the course of this world or the course of the kingdom of darkness, it has a course for people to follow. It has a carefully laid out and organized path for people to follow. You remember those verses in Job? Where is the way where light dwelleth? And that thou shouldest know the paths to the house thereof? There is a way to where light dwells. But the course of this world will not lead you there. 
The course of this world is designed to lead you away from it, not into it. The course of this world will lead you in the other direction. Why would that be? Well, who sets? Who plans? Who organizes the course of this world? Notice, where in time past ye walked according to or in harmony with the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. So the prince of the air is the prince of darkness and he sets the course. It's according to him. It's according to him. He decides the agenda. So according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Now this is the most profound explanation of the world that you live in today. You cannot understand the world you live in without understanding this verse. You just can't. It's just not possible. The prince of the power of the air is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What does that mean? Well, it means that behind the people who decide what the content will be in the evening news and what content will be in the programs that people watch on TV and behind the people who make laws and behind the people who run the pharmaceutical cartels and behind the people who run Wall Street, and behind all of the nefarious ideas that people have of how to ruin our world, according to this verse, the prince of the power of the air is the spirit that now works in them. So from now on, from this moment on, this is how I want you to understand your television set. Your television sits there in your living room or it sits there in your bedroom. This is what you need to know about your television set. That everything that comes out of it is coming from his brain. So when you're looking at your TV, you just picture the brain that's in it that's putting forth all the garbage that's being spewed and puked into your house. Because that's how it is. I'm talking about all the news programs. All the programs that not only mock God, but laugh at God and laugh at those who believe in God. Not just talking about that. Talking about all the programs that leave God out. People go through all kinds of catastrophes on TV. All kinds of things happen. Never is God mentioned. Never is God appealed to. Except as a swear word. You know, I used to say, TV is life without God. But now, it has become anti-God and anti-Christ. So when you sit there, you just remember that behind the men who plan the programming and behind the directors who decide what content will be in your movies, movies that laugh at God and laugh at you, and just remember... 
All those movies that show your children how to be disobedient, how to be rebellious against their parents, how to get involved in every perverted sex that there is known to man. Remember that behind the men who plan it all, hovering above them, behind them, is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Have you ever wondered why there are all over the world, all over the earth, places in the, in the world are known for different sins? Have you ever thought about that? Some places are more focused on sin than on others. Some places are. Like, for example, Las Vegas. It's known for gambling and prostitution. Right? Doesn't mean other things aren't there, but that's... What has San Francisco always been known for? Yeah, right. It, it was known for that, right? Miami has always been known as the drug capital of the Lord. It's like the, the place where drugs come through. What? Oh, did I say world, 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 capital of the world. Who do you think hovers above Washington, D.C.? Deception and lying. Deception and lying. Other parts of the world now are coming into focus as producing terrorism and communism and... Right? Why all the different emphasis on these things? Where in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Above all these different places in the world, hover the prince of the power of the air. That's why Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's different ones over different municipalities and different cities and different countries. You live in the kingdom of darkness. You live in it. You know, like Jesus Christ told his disciples, you're in the world, but you're not of it. That's a transdispensational truth. You are in it, but you're not of it. That's the kingdom of darkness. I haven't even, touched, haven't even touched the tip of the iceberg of that subject. Okay? Everything that God instituted in the beginning, marriage, marriage between a man and a woman, the family, even government, all of it is under attack. You know that in Acts chapter 17, it's God who set boundaries around the nations? Do you know he did, he did that? Do you know what the counterfeit would like, wants to do? Remove the boundaries. Remove the boundaries. Open the borders. Let them all in. It's all under attack. And behind the attack is the prince of the power of the air. The prince of the kingdom of of darkness. Are we glad that God sent Paul to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God? Again, what's the main characteristic that differentiates us from those who are still in the kingdom of darkness? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Is that a big deal? You know, this is why Paul 
in Colossians 1.12 begins with the word giving thanks. Giving thanks. Mm -hmm. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, which he identifies in the next verse, verse as the kingdom of his dear son. Listen, to think that one day in your past, you belonged to the kingdom of darkness and all the deception that came with it. And one day, because of your faith, not because of anything you've done, not because of any good works that you thought God would accept as an acceptable exchange for the free gift of eternal life, but simply because you trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God forgave you. And God made us meet. Which means He qualified us. He made us... He made us fit. He made us so that we could partake in that kingdom of light. The kingdom of His dear Son. Giving thanks is the first thing that a person who's translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son does. That's the first thing he does. I remember when I was first saved and I met a, a friend in the church I was going to and we got an apartment together. And I remember one day we were getting ready to go to an evening service and I'm laying on my bed just staring at the ceiling. He walked in and he said... Why are you smiling? I said, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that I've been forgiven and that I'm saved. And I was. And I'm forgiven. I remember that. He walked in and I'm smiling and I didn't know he was going to walk in. And that, that's all I could say. That's what I was thinking about. I was thinking about my salvation and my freedom and I was forgiven and my sin was gone. That's what characterizes people who are out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You look at the world around you. It's falling apart. Look at how people are deceived, believing all kinds of nonsense that the media is just pumping into their little, deceived, brainwashed heads. Look at the world. You can understand it. Because you understand that you're no longer in the kingdom of darkness. But you have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. What a great truth. Look, you know I love this. Every child of Adam is born with God looking at them through the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments say, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And God shall by no means clear the guilty. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Here you are today. One day you heard that Jesus Christ died, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day. And then you heard, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And you believe the gospel of your salvation. And when you believe, God stopped looking at you through the law. And he began looking at you through the cross, and he saw you in Christ. Forgiven. You were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins is found here, not there. And then, instead of death, you got eternal life. Instead of going to hell, you're going to heaven for all eternity. That's the message that was committed to the apostle, to the, the Gentiles who called it my gospel. It's Paul's gospel. Amen? Amen? We're not in the kingdom of darkness. We're in the kingdom of God's dear son. Amen. We've been translated out of that nasty thing. Amen? Amen.
If you're here, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Or if you're watching online, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior today. And you're still in that kingdom. And your eyes have been opened to the truth of what's going on. Look at the world. Look at Antifa. Look at, look at the evil that's happening in our streets, in our cities, in politics, both Republican and Democrat. Look at all the evil and all the deception. And if you couldn't see it before now and you see it now, thank God your eyes were opened. Now, you need to believe the gospel of your salvation. That Jesus Christ died for you. That he was buried. And that he rose again the third day. And you put your faith in that. And you're trusting that for the forgiveness of your sins. And you are forgiven and God sees you in Christ. This is where you want to be when you die. You don't want to be there. And everybody who's here knows they came through Jesus Christ. Freely, by grace, a gift that you could not earn, that you don't deserve, you can't pay for, that God simply gives to you. And you just receive it by faith. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day when you can make your peace with God and believe Jesus Christ died for you. And trust him for the forgiveness of your sins. You do that within the recesses of your quiet heart. God's not looking for your lips to move. God's not looking for you to say a sinner's prayer. There is no such thing as a sinner's prayer. It doesn't exist. Show me one in the Bible. It doesn't exist. The only thing that exists in the Bible is Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through, through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no other way. So if you don't know Christ as your Savior today, today is the day of salvation. This day will end very soon. Okay? You have time today. You still have time right now for sure to get, to get right. Amen? Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we're so thankful that we can look in the Scripture, look in the Word of God, and understand things that heretofore were not understandable, but now we can understand. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.